Next up, we have Taiwan Limited, which is ASX code TVN. The market cap is uh, 117 million. And today from Taiwan, we welcome Grant Wilson, Executive Chair. Taiwan engages in the exploration, evaluation, and development of mineral resources. The company's current focus is on vanadium and titanium. Grant, please take it away. Thanks, Manny. And thanks at the top for getting the name right. We've had a little bit of Tivan uh, floating around recently. So just to clarify for everyone, it is Tyvan, and that's titanium and, and vanadium. Uh, the company's been on a pretty epic journey for the past 12 months. It started with a change of control from a previous company referred to as TNG Limited, which concluded at the end of last year. And there's been some really, really significant changes. Um, these slides that I'll, I'll work through today, I presented at NC Resources Week last week in Darwin, where we're now headquartered. It's about 800 people there. So we've sort of set things alight up north. And the purpose of today is just to pull through some sites quickly. Um, we do have a larger investor deck uh, for people online. That'll be updated next week, I think. We're on a six monthly cycle with that. So today's more conceptual, ju just to sort of spread the word about what we're working on, because we are working fast. And this is a highly differentiated value proposition and company that's emerging. So the first slide is just to explain the big vision, really, that we have for the vanadium sector in particular. The secular bull market that we're in for critical minerals, you know, we fully believe in and we expect it will run for decades. There's been two waves in our view, the rare earths wave focused around Mount World blindness. Uh, so call that 2010 to maybe 2017. That was in the lead for, for batteries and magnets. And then we moved into the lithium wave, which is centered around a use case of EVs. And you saw again, key resources such as green bushes leading the way. Our big view on vanadium is that the industry will not take shape in Australia and probably globally, unless it's led with the best and most strategically significant resource. To build a whole industrialization pathway for a new sector is not a trivial exercise and you need to lead with the most significant and the highest grade and the best resource globally and that's Spiwa. And we acquired Spiwa in February from a company called KRR who now is on our register. It's located near where I am today. I'm in Broome today. It's over in the East Kimberley uh, near, near Wyndham <laughs> and we've obviously been working on it all year. TNG owned the resource next to that in the slide called Mount Peak. That's in, <clears throat> sorry, the center of Australia. And you'll see these other resources globally. Some of them are in production in Brazil and South Africa. The ones that tend to make production are the ones with a very high vanadium concentrate grade. The ones that we think will wither on the vine have low concentrate grade or are too far away from port or are buried underground. Spiwa has four really unique and significant characteristics. A very high vanadium grade, very close to port, only hundred kilometers away. It's outcropping, so practically on the surface. And you can see this incredible size on the chart very clearly, capable of supporting a strategically significant project for Australia for up to 150 years and launching the vanadium industry globally. Next. The second big move that we had to make to recover from what I walked into at TNG Limited was to relocate the company and particularly the mineral critical mineral processing facility to an industrial zone capable of facilitating what we really require to get it going, which is large scale renewable energy, access to large scale water resources, ideally proximate to an urban workforce. And these things exist at the Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct in Darwin. It's been making a lot of news recently. We're gonna end up in a Senate inquiry before the end of the year. There's various other proponents there, but Taiwan was first to be out and proud. That was February in a deal that I did with the NC government. We're very grateful to the NT government for supporting our transition back from center of Australia to middle arm. It was a very important staging point and really set the tone for many other initiatives um, that we've run this year. So at this stage, the basic proposal is to have a long run track towards middle arm. You could think of that as seven to even 10 years out. It's a very ambitious long run project that could be definitive for the Northern Australia in the sense that it has a hundred year life. And it can be a true sovereign capability for Australia in vanadium and in titanium, but we'll need the facilitation for middle arm and we'll need big solar projects to come online to provide that renewable energy that we cannot get off the grid. And we are formally partnered up with Sun Cable, which has recently been acquired by, by Quinbrook, which is a fantastic facilitation partner for us. In the shorter term, though, our priority is to get the company to revenue. And so we are in the process 
of building a fast track vanadium salt roast at site at Spiwa. And we've actually announced this morning that our EPC contractor of choice is the preeminent global vanadium engineering firm, which is Hatch, and they've joined us uh, just this morning. So we're at Middle Arm and Spiwa up in the Kimberley, and we've been spending a lot of time up here this year. Next is critical in this part of the country to have deep and constructive and early engagement with traditional owners. So if you could just turn the slide, thanks. We've put this framework out in the public domain in the past couple of months. It's resulted from an enormous amount of work that I've put in pub, uh, privately over the past six months. My heritage is actually Alice Springs. I grew up there. So I've always had um, you know, strong connections on country with the First Nations leaders and communities. And I've been repairing a lot of those relationships on behalf of TNG to Taiban this year. But happily, we're at a point now with the key land councils, the Kimberley Land Council here in Broome, and with other key traditional owner groups, such as Larrakia in Darwin, where we're able to advance in ways that other people will not be able to, in my view. And that involves us moving beyond the traditional concepts of free prior informed consent and into genuine early inclusion and participation, we hope, for our traditional owners at Spiwa over time as well. I can't say too much about this portfolio uh, today. It's complex, but I can say that we've made a lot of progress. It's also facilitated us being on country already this year, which is highly unusual, and able to move our baseline environmental surveys along at, at rapid, rapid speed. Next, a shout out to the team we've put together this year. There's only a couple of people left from the TNG era, if I'm frank, and we've gone through a whole rejuvenation process. And this is one of the standout achievements, I think, this year. It's very visible. Um, we appointed three high profile people to a technical advisory group in May of this year including a former managing director of Rio Tinto's titanium business globally, Maria's, Professor Maria Skylas Kazakos, the inventor of Vanadium batteries, who is Australian, and she's quite a legend, not just in Australia, but right around the world. Simon Flowers, who facilitated the master planning for the NT government at Middle Arm over the past couple of years. Additionally, we've been working closely with Syra all year, and we still hope to be able to be public uh, with what we've been working on there in terms of the critical mineral processing technology uh, before the end of the year. Briefly, we've also strengthened the board significantly. The hostile campaign that I ran and led last year resulted in two boards being dismissed and six directors ultimately leaving the company. So we now have four directors, everyone's new. Um, some very high profile people have joined our board, including Christine Charles, who's very well known in the sustainability space, in the First Nations space, in academia. And most recently, Dr. Guy DeBell, former Reserve Bank Deputy Governor, joined us from Fortescue a couple of weeks ago to lend a hand in terms of his broad views on the, how the energy transition will take shape in Australia, as well as the sustainability financing agenda. And guys hit the ground running, and it's a great privilege to be working with him. Next. This is the grand vision, the life cycle, how we're going to build this entire industry. And it's a bit complicated, but a lot of our shareholders will be quite familiar with this slide. The key message here is circularity. At Taiban, we believe circularity will be the new sustainability. And circularity often gets misused. There's a little bit of greenwashing floating around when people use this term. An easy way to think about it is that someone's inputs have to be someone's outputs and vice versa. And you'll see in our instance, this sovereign capability that I'm referring to is the ability to mine at Spiwa to beneficiation, ultimately derive vanadium oxides, which can be turned into vanadium electrolyte, which can power a battery, which can be attached to the grid or indeed a large solar or wind resource. Now we need their power and they need our battery, hence the circularity. So it's this sovereign capability, which is quite unique for Taiwan. This cannot take place in the lithium sector. It cannot take place in the rare earth sector. All of these precursors will always be made in Asia. In Australia, we can do all of this because vanadium batteries are elemental. And if we crack it at Spiwa, we will lead the way, not just in terms of this life cycle, but in terms of deployment in Australia, as well as deployment in key markets overseas, including Taiwan and especially the US. Finally, this is to emphasize the scale and scope and impact of, of this ambition. Spiwa is such a monumental resource that we've calculated in turning <clears throat> the vanadium into oxides 
and then into electrolyte and into batteries, you have the capability to offset and abate emissions from either coal, gas, or oil at a scale which is roughly twice Australia's entire carbon budget. And so this is, without argument, uh, the most forward-facing project definition in Australia, certainly in the critical mineral sector. And we view <clears throat> SPIWA itself as the largest carbon sink on the planet in mineralized form. So it's a unique project. It's critically important for Australia that we get this right. And we're very much on that path. So the grand vision, which has been in the newspapers up in Darwin and across uh, the Kimberley, which is, which is exciting a lot of people, if I can say, is the final slide. <clears throat> and just to emphasize once again, um, the opportunity that we have with large solar projects that we're working with already to facilitate um, their batteries and for us to work in a circular definition to, uh, to offtake their power. This in turn then provides them with an opportunity to build more ambitious uh, export industries such as hydrogen, ammonia and so forth over time. But it's fair to say SPIWA and the project we're now working on working on rapidly is fundamentally important to the definition of Northern Australia in the next five, 10 years. So that's a quick wrap, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, Grant, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we do have a few questions that, uh, that have come in. Uh, why don't I start with, um, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, uh, can you elaborate a little bit or discuss uh, Taiban's plans uh, with regards to funding for the pathway ahead? And is there the prospect of a, you know, potential project partner or, or, or even a strategic investment? Yeah, yeah. You can imagine <clears throat> with all the changes over the course of this year, we've had to manage our fiscal resources very carefully. And that's been, that's, that's still the reality. Uh, we've actually achieved all of this pretty much on a shoestring. And so there's two broad paths ahead. We can continue to raise capital organically, work our way up through the cap spectrum from retail to small instos to larger instos. And we're on that path. We raised $6 million mid-year in a highly differentiated fashion. If you look through the critical mineral sector, the average discount this year has been around 23 to 25%. We raised money 1% discount in a, in a deal which was, again, highly differentiated and reflects the superior access that Taiwan has to capital markets. So that's an organic path. The concept of a strategic investor is starting to come into play. I can confirm that. These processes tend to take about six months, tend to involve you know, extensive due diligence. And so looking at that more as a first half uh, next year uh, type objective, but fair to say we've advanced the ball significantly uh, recently as well. And not just one ball, as with everything that I've done at Taiwan, I believe in the principle of competitive tension, which is to say, even if there are big suitors are now very interested in what we're doing, I don't just want one dialogue. I want two or three to ensure that we get the best interest for the best outcome for the company and for shareholders into next year. Okay. Um, and uh, the next question is really just asking, and you touched on this during the presentation, but but can you just elaborate a little bit on what the time the, the, the time frames are you are operating towards just remind us how that how that works and, and if you could overlay that a little bit with um you know with what you know what you're um expecting to see from uh approvals from the approvals perspective with traditional landowners the federal government um you know the um the, the state government etc how does that all fit in together yeah i'll try to summarize briefly Again, in April, after things had started to settle down, we described to shareholders a long pathway. We refer to this as a Taiban Plus pathway, where we're working on the critical minerals technology with CSIRO, and we'll have to pilot that. And that pilot plan uh, will take time to engineer and build and operate. It's a two to three year project by itself. So this is one very long train. And ultimately, that very large project will require large scale facilitation from government and from solar projects, which may not be ready. And so in July, uh, we started to talk publicly and then have since put a lot of detail in the public domain about the fast track, which is a known technology pathway where we can just go for the vanadium and we're not relying upon anyone else. 
Obviously, there are approvals, and these will all come together in the next couple of years, both First Nations and environmental, not so much government, that side of it's already effectively taken care of. But we see the approval processes coalescing in 2025, putting us on track for FID on the fast track in 2026. The appointment with Hatch is important in this regard, because in the next couple of months, they're coming through and reviewing all of the work that we've done for six months, all of the really, really technical work. And it's a very, very sophisticated um, team that we have. And it's an opportunity for Hatch to come through and to cross-check with their knowledge of the industry, how our internal timelines hold up. So I expect to be able to provide more clarity, more precision on timelines at the AGM in November. And that's the aim. Okay, great. And just one last one. Uh, what are, just for the uh, for investors and shareholders, what should they be looking for in terms of news flow over the remainder of this year and, and early into next year? What are the key announcements we're looking for and that we should keep an eye out for? Yeah, sure. The shareholders that have been with us through the big change will know that we're operating at absolute velocity force. I come from a hedge fund background. There's people who come from finance, from private equity. It's a very different setup here. This is not a resources company. This is an energy transition company being led by some of the most dynamic and sophisticated management in the country. So I want to round out this year with our AGM, which is November 17. So it's still got about nearly two months to play with. Yeah, with more deals. I think I've done seven or eight deals this year. There's a couple more. I think we can close them out. I'm actually using the AGM as a deadline to put a little bit of pressure on some people at the table. I think we'll get our some news from Syro. It's public. We've said already that we're working in close collaboration, and I hope that this can all come together. Syro is a slow-moving beast, but it's very important for us, and it will put Taiwan in unique territory. I think we'll have more news flow next week, which will surprise people, and we'll just keep, yeah, we're just going to keep hammering away. And that's what's required. That was what's required through the change. But to execute and to build a project and indeed an industry of the significance that we're talking about, you do need that mindset and you need teamwork most of all. And we have a fantastic team that we put together this year and we're genuinely excited about the path ahead. Grant, thank you very much for that. That was great. Have a great weekend and uh, hopefully we'll see you back here telling us about uh, everything you've achieved the next time. 